So how's everyone doing? I promised myself, this is my first TED Talk. So I promised myself and I promised you I would not put you back to sleep. So today, let me start my topic actually by inviting you to sing along and put yourself in this situation with me. So imagine I'm your good friend and I want to find a boyfriend. So then I come to you and ask you to fix me up with a guy. What would be the first question you want to ask me? Definitely what kind of guy you like, right? So my preferences. Then I will tell you that I like smart, well-educated guys who are good at conversations. So with these three preferences in mind, then you go ahead and find me somebody like Sheldon Cooper. He's smart, he's well-educated, and he definitely talks a lot. So then we go on a date. And afterwards, you follow up with me and ask me, so what do you think about the date? And then I reply like this. <sighs> and then you ask me again, so what do you think about Sheldon? And then I reply like this. And then you finally pop up the question and ask me, do you maybe want to go out with other guys? I said, yes, please. So then, what do you know right now? Instead of the three previous preferences I have given you, smart, well-educated, who, who is good at conversations, I didn't tell you anything else, but you can guess, right? The fact I was signing, I was shaking my head, I was shrouding my shoulder, pouching my lips. She probably does not like Sheldon Cooper, but you still don't know why. So then you take your chance and you find me somebody like Howard Wallowitz who's also smart, well-educated, and good at conversation, but who is a lot different than Sheldon Cooper. Then we go on a date again. Afterwards, I still say nothing and say, next, please. And then you find me somebody like Nenner Hofstadter. And the same thing happened again. So what could be the end to the story? There are two possible results. So first is that when you find me the whole cast, the whole band, this whole game of Big Bang Theory for me to date. And then I finally realized that you're not going to be able to find the right guy for me because you don't know what I want. So I just stop asking you for the favor. Or the other option I can have is that I could just sit around and wait and wait and wait and finally, bam, you find the right guy for me and I can go on a second date with. But how long does it take? One month, two months, or even longer? So this scenario is very much like the relationship between big data and consumers today. The concept of big data is that the companies or the data scientists were trying to find, trying to guess from your untold information, so from your body language, not even body language, from your online behaviors, from your shopping cart behaviors, trying to guess what do you like, what do you don't like. So just like what you did before in the scenario, you can guess just from my body language, you can guess my opinion about Sheldon Cooper. And we as consumers, we always just take approach and stick around and wait for the big data happen around us, wait for the company to figure us out and put the right information in front of our eyes. But will that happen? Definitely. But how long does it take? Five years, 10 years, or even longer? So we, as consumers, we actually are not proactive enough. All the talks about big data today, all the discussion about big data has always been focused on how companies can use it to get more information, how companies can use it to target their customers smarter. But we, as consumers, we have little voice in these kind of discussions, but we are influenced by it. So think about the emails that you get for one day or think about the promotional emails you get. How many of them are actually relevant? I'm 24 years old and I'm getting a promotional email from Body Shop saying that I need their anti-aging product. Now think about the Facebook you're on. Besides that lovely post by your friends and family, think about the Facebook sponsor content. How many of them you actually can remember? How, how many of the Facebook ads you actually click on? I would guess a few, right? So we as consumers, we don't have a lot of power over the content that we see 
or the information that's been pushed to us. So today, I'm going to turn the table around and ask the question that, as consumers, can we take advantage of the big data? Or is there anything that we can do to take some control, to take some power back in terms of the content that we see online or the information that we receive? And the answer is definitely yes. It is exactly because we are living in the age of big data. Then we can turn our information, we can turn our own data into power. But how? We all have our loved brands, we all have the movies that we're interested in, or the apps that we regularly use, or the social media we are on all the time. So why don't we, as consumers, do some start smart targeting ourselves? Trying to figure out the simple actions that we can do to improve our experience. So let's go back to the dating case. There is a very popular dating app called Coffee Meets Bagel, and how it works is pretty simple. So it will show you a profile, one profile per day, and then you can choose either to like it or pass it. After you're done choosing, you, you, there's gonna be a feedback panel pop up and ask you, why do you like this girl, or why did you pass this girl? So we know that just basing, looking at the profile, basing on the several pictures that these people send out, we cannot know if this person is gonna be the love of our life, or we cannot even predict how our conversation is gonna be or how the day is gonna go, but we as a user, we do wanna get more profiles that we can actually like. We do wanna know more interesting people. So what can we do? Is there anything that we users can do to improve our experience? First, we need to figure out how Coffee Meets Bagel, how these dating apps is doing it. They actually explicitly tell you that in the frequently asked questions session that a lot, of, a lot of apps will have. So here's what I find out. So they will look at your Facebook friend circle, so basically who are you friends with on Facebook, and then we'll, they will try to look into the pro system and look for profiles who share similar qualities with your Facebook friend. They figure that you are more likely to like them. And the other things they look at is that your user history, so how you use this app. Besides like the profile you fill out at the beginning or the preferences you indicated, they also look at what kind of people you have already liked, what kind of people you have passed, or how long does it take for you to like one profile. So in the, in the group of people that you have already liked, they're trying to look at what kind of char characteristics make you like these people, and where do they find that information? From the feedback panel you feel out, right? So for instance, if you feedback that I like people who are smart, kind, and cute, so that the system will look into this pro into their system, look, look for profiles that share similar qualities with the people you have already liked. But however, these qualities have different voting power in terms of what kind of profile will get to you next. For instance, sometimes kind is more important than being cute. So people with the kind quality probably will get to me first. So right now, we know the basic mechanism, we know the basic logic behind this dating app and how we can take advantage of it to improve our experience. For instance, I want to date an actor. So in the perfect world, in the fake world, of course, Eddie Reitman, who is a 2015 Oscar-winning actor, is single and is using this app. And somehow this app pushed his profile to me. I'm very happy, right? This is the exactly kind of profile I'm looking for. So what can I do? I will feedback every aspect that I like about Eddie Reitman. For instance, uh, he has a great smile, he's sweet, he's energetic, but I will personally write down actor in the blank section where they ask you to enter your own word. By doing this, it's like sticking a note to the profile that I'm saying, I like Eddie Reitman because he has a great smile, he's sweet, he's kind, but especially because he is an actor. And every time the app sent me an actor profile, somebody like Tom Hanks or Ben Affleck, I would do the same thing and put in the actor quality personally in the bank section. By doing this over and over again, I'm giving the actor quality a lot of voting power in terms of what is going to be the next person on my lap, app. So who, who knows? The next person profile on my app could be Leonardo DiCaprio. So this is how we can use our information, how we can use our own data 
to actually to get what we want faster by having the mindset of analytics. This could be applied to a lot of experience. So how many of you, by show of hands, use Netflix? Great, a lot of you. So you know that after watching a movie or after watching a TV show, Netflix will recommend some new movies for you to watch. And as users, we definitely want to enjoy watching them. We don't want to waste a nice Friday night watching a bad movie. So how can we make sure that happens? How can we improve that experience? So first, we need to understand how Netflix is doing that. So how do Netflix actually is recommending the movies to us? There's a way everybody in the room knows, and everybody in the room can use it. By Google it, how does Netflix Netflix recommend movies. I'm not asking you to know the exact algorithm or what do they calculate to make a prediction. I'm not asking you to know the, like the analytic theory behind it, but just know the basic logic behind it. So here's what I find out. Suppose we have Stuart, the minion. He's also using Netflix, and he has the following ratings. He, like Harry Potter or so, rated it three stars, and Gone Girl, four stars, and Twilight, one star. So Netflix will look at these ratings as Stewart's preferences, as Stewart's movie taste. So then Netflix will go into the system and try to find a group of people who have similar ratings. For instance, they also rated Harry Potter three stars, or they rated Gone Girl five stars, they didn't even watch Twilight. So then the Netflix will look at this group of people, probably minions also using Netflix, and trying to figure out what they have watched and what Stuart hasn't. For instance, they have watched Harry Potter, Gone Girl, Black Swan, and Inception. They have really all of them very highly love these movies. So Netflix will recommend Black Swan and Inception to Stuart since he hasn't watched it. Because they share very similar movie tastes, then Stuart will probably like it. So right now we know that Netflix has this mechanism, has this logic about recommending movies to their users. How can we take advantage of it? What kind of actions we can do to actually make the movies interesting? We can rate more movies. The more movies we rate, the more complete the profile is, so that Netflix could go into the system and find an accurate group of people to recommend interesting movies for us. They say data is powerful because companies can use it to predict the future, companies can use it to make more informed decisions and to target their customers better. But data is powerful for us as well as consumers. We have the power at our fingertips by, our, by having the mindset of analytics, by putting the right information in the right place. We can also get more interesting movies. We can have better content on Facebook. We can even get better chances to go out with Leonardo DiCaprio if you like him. So be proactive and empower yourself with your information, with your data, and find out the things that you love and how it works with the basic mechanism behind the brands that you love or the things that you regularly use or the website you're on all the time and try to find simple actions to improve your own experience. Then you can claim your experience around big data. Thank you.